All right, um, moving on, we are going to have the first of our uh, double header sessions on basically the possibility of delaying block proposals in, in Ethereum, so so-called timing games, uh, two analyses that have been prepared by two different node operators. So first, we're going to have Vlad and Pavel from P2P.org presenting their analysis and case study. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're excited to be here today. Uh, so let's start. Ah, just a second. So uh, let me introduce your company for this evening. Uh, uh, we, with Pavel, we present you uh, uh, our recent research about time and games. Uh, here is our contacts uh, in Twitter, just in case you want to reach out after the presentation. Uh, so uh, today we will want today we want to talk uh, with you about the proposal time in games. Uh, it's been a hot topic in the community in different periods and attracted a lot of researchers' attention, especially recently when it became evident that more and more node operators are engaging in these games. However, at the same time, these topics. Uh, is a new for many node operators because uh, node operators who have figured it out aren't keen on sharing their insights, possibly to avoid getting involved in all these arguments uh, around, especially since most of them already involved in timing games and don't want to be punished in Twitter. Uh, so here we are. Uh, our aim for today is adding transparency about timing games for everyone here and sharing very uh, interesting numbers and findings from our recent research. This topic is still complex and uh, we will likely ask more new questions and uh, give you an answers. But I hope uh, these numbers will help in further researchers and discussions. And the least one notice before we start, uh, timing games exist on every part of uh, the supply chain. Searchers want uh, to get mempool data and process it as soon as possible while reducing uh, transportation latency by co-locating with builders. Uh, at the same time, block builders try to validate uh, bundles and construct blocks faster than competitors do. Uh, at the same uh, time, aiming a rapid submission of blocks to relay. Speed equals information equals money and so on and so forth. Uh, however, in this presentation, we will examine proposer timing games played by validators, which are different. Let me pass the word to Pavel Yashin to talk more about it. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, well, I hope so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So today we are going to talk about timing games for blog proposal. And uh, yeah, before we go into further details, I'd like to briefly recap the essence of the blog proposers, uh, blog proposing in the MEV boost. And uh, yeah, just briefly describe what is the mechanics and what can be the reasons behind the timing games. Um, so now we exist in the MEV boost reality and more than 90% blocks are proposed through it. That new layer uh, since the merge introduced proposer builder separation and uh, kind of created the corresponding MEV supply chain with many specialized actors, as Vladislav mentioned before, builders, searchers, uh, relays, and so on. Um, so as soon as proposers and builders are usually different entities in MEV Boost, uh, they need some intermediary to communicate effectively. Uh, relays play the role of these intermediaries, um, and they basically have different duties, various duties. Uh, from block simulation and propagation, and most importantly, to uh, most importantly, relay is an auction and actually an auctioneer for slots. Proposers are trying to sell slot space to the block builders, and block builders compete against each other uh, by raising the payment to the proposer. And relay, yeah, is an infrastructure that passes the block from block builders to block proposers. Uh, relays collect the blocks, uh, and uh, when a proposer uh, makes a request to the relay, so-called get header request, relay chooses the best uh, block from the point of payment to the proposer, the highest payment of the proposer, and gives it back to a proposer. 
Then proposer had to sign it and return to the relay. A relay will start to propagate the block across the network. And all of this should ideally happen inside the first four seconds of the slot, according to the specs. And uh, that will happen almost every slot that, uh, yeah, uh, when the proposer is using MV boost. Um, can you, yeah, next slide, please. Ah, uh, yeah, thanks. So as I mentioned, relays are auctions and proposers are monopolists that are selling the slot. Uh, you can see on the picture uh, the visualization of the uh, block auction in some relay happening in some slot. Um, lines are the bids from block builders um, and we see the competition uh, among them. Uh, the x-axis is denominated in slot time, so zero is, is, is the moment of the slot start. Um, we can see that the value of the best bid is rising as the time proceeds. Um, and in this particular case, uh, a validator made a request to relay and got the bid that is uh, shown as a red point on the picture um, and got the reward of 0 0.06 Ethereum for the block proposal. Um, well, on this picture, we can notice that if a uh, validator made uh, a request a little bit later than it actually did, uh, they will get more rewards due to the growth of the maximum bid value. And the increase in this case would be around 10%. So we wondered how we can summarize the statistics and what will it look like for a kind of broader picture for average picture that a validator can face uh, every block proposal. Uh, next slide, please. And we made estimation um, based on uh, 3.4 thousand, uh, 3.4 thousand uh, slots. Uh, these slots are pretty random. <coughs> And the data was uh, the auction data from uh, all relays. So this is kind of the estimation for generalized auction uh, that happened in, um, inside like node. As soon as proposers usually uh, request different relays and choose the best bid, best bid value from different relays. So we kind of united the data from all relays and simulated uh, the best bit value over the time. Uh, so we noticed that the rewards in general grow over time and small bits are more sensitive to the delays. Uh, that's introduced the problem of sampling to make a good estimate. We had to, uh, to get a lot of data because small bits are more frequent, much more frequent than the bigger ones. Um, so to resolve this issue, we estimated through weighted average, and we took uh, the marginal sensitivity for different bid sizes, and the weights were the probability of the bid occurring in the network. Uh, so based on the estimate, we got that validators uh, can uh, see 10 plus 10% 10 reward increase. Um, after one second of delay comparing to the uh, slot start. So this is kind of juicy increase. And uh, we see that temptation can be high for validators to delay the bid requests. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, but it's very... So yeah, we observe the increase in the rewards and it's very tricky where the money come from. Um, we list here more most obvious uh, reasons for that. And yeah, the most obvious is that as the time passes, more transactions appear in the mempool. So it means more priorities, more MEV opportunities. Um, and uh, yeah, so the bid value grows 
builders incorporate these opportunities into their blocks. Um, another reason that could be is the competition between builders. Um, so the value comes from the redistribution of profits from builders to validators. Uh, but still, we need some yeah estimation for that, more research on top of that. Um, very often, we can uh, see the statement that the timing games are zero-sum games that actually all the value that comes in the delayed proposal, uh, it comes from the next uh, slot proposal. Uh, I think that there is a big part of truth in this statement, but still uh, there are things that can, uh, that can uh, kind of introduce more sophisticated view uh, to the problem. For example, different builders can be can have different strategies, different private order flow. And uh, in general, we believe that the topic requires more research and further exploration. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. Um, yeah, as the, yeah, yes. As the delaying is uh, rewarding for the proposers, uh, we wanted to figure out how it changes, uh, how the delay, bid request delays are changing all the time, like on the global view. Uh, so we covered uh, data for winning block submission time. This is kind of proximetric for uh, the get header request timing. And we can see that uh, all the time since the November of the last year, uh, the winning block submission time was growing, meaning that yeah, the more late blocks are getting included into the blockchain. Uh, and it's very interesting dynamics. Um, there, I think that there are several hypothetical, hypothetical reasons behind this trend. Uh, first of all, uh, Relays performance can be degrading uh, due to the higher load that occurred with the number of validators growth. Uh, then the optimistic submission was introduced on relays in April as far as I remember, or in March. Uh, and submission, optimistic submission, uh, yeah, removes most of the simulation time from relays. So more recent bids uh, can be accepted by validators and uh, yeah more validators can be can start to play timing games and this is what we're talking about right now um we will see that it's also the case and that can contribute to this trend um, also there could be another effects like more validators share uh running their nodes in the regions that are geographically far away from relays, but we cannot like prove it right now. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a yeah, simple statistics about um, optimistically submitted bids. Uh, we can see how their appearance in the March and their uh, share in our sample at least has grown to 40% of the uh, winning bids. Um, I think that it indeed could contribute to the trend, but since the June, we don't see a significant increase in optimistic submissions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, even for us, uh, we haven't changed our setup. Uh, so yeah, everything equal. Um, the median submission time has increased uh, median median block submission time has increased over time for some uh, yeah, unknown reason. And I guess that could be a, a nice topic to make an additional research on. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. I guess uh, this yeah, slide... Yeah, I'll back to Vladislav, yeah. Yeah, uh, speaking about timing games, uh, it's very interesting to research how this factor impacts the overall picture. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, we can be 100% sure if uh, node operators play the, uh, these games intentionally or uh, not until an official announcement of uh, this node operator uh, 
uh, do we observe artificial request delay or just weak setup or, or unusual infrastructure location with high latency? We don't know. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are some symptoms of time, time gamers, and uh, we took uh, them as a basis for an analysis and uh, to assess how many operators play time games and what health consequences for the network uh, this leads to. Uh, so uh, on this chart, uh, we see operator A, which increased bit submission time from zero to uh, two seconds. Uh, and uh, we interpret such large and rapid changes in dynamics as time games. Of course, uh, one can, uh, we can imagine changes, uh, changing uh, the setup and or locating it to Antarctica, but it, in this case, we would expect to see a greater spread of uh, dispersion. So uh, we consider this as a timing, timing games. Um, one another example um, is operator B. It hasn't got such rapid visual changes, but uh, cluster analysis shows that this operator has three different setups starting from September uh, with a uh, bit submission time around, uh, it's here, yeah, uh, with bit submission time around uh, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.7, and uh, 1.2 seconds. Again, we can be 100% sure that it's intentional timing games, but we mark this operator as suspected in timing games. So uh, we extracted uh, 300,000 slots and uh, their bit submission time from May to December, mapped them with uh, node operators and divided node operators into two segments, no gamers and suspected to be gamers, according to logic uh, I introduced you above. And now we can answer the following questions with a certain degree of confidence, of course. Uh, so the first one question is how many uh, node operators playing in time games? Uh, this is the first one. And uh, we actually identified four C large CX players. Uh, and uh, 11 non-custodial staking providers that uh, likely likely play in time games. So, and uh, in uh, speaking about the share of validators, in CX it's about 40%, uh, and in direct staking and uh, liquid staking providers, it's about 20% or something like it. Um, and well, it's very, it's very interesting uh, having these two segments also uh, to check another one number. Um, so uh, how submission time uh, changes over, over time depending on the segment. And this is interesting because uh, non-gamer segment likely shows uh, bit time changes due to overall network latency increase. And uh, this uh, this, these bars actually demonstrate uh, this dynamics as well. So, and uh, this uh, light green bars uh, demonstrates another segment of uh, time gamers, and uh, it's likely uh, very, very likely artificial changes. And uh, yeah, um, the next question following uh, these uh, uh, examples, its consequences, uh, and what we uh, what we can check here. Uh, it's very, very uh, obvious, uh, uh, obvious question and obvious, uh, ob obvious observation that uh, increasing bit time shifts uh, time of attesters getting new block. And uh, this uh, first chart, uh, we can clearly see it. Uh, the red line demonstrates uh, winning bit submission times in dynamic uh, overall or overall network. And the uh, blue line demonstrates block arrival time. Uh, we uh, for for one particular uh, node in European region. So this is like a disclaimer because uh, we don't have a lot of nodes around the world which uh, collecting this data, but we have one in European region and uh, we collected this data last six months, so we can share the results with you. Uh, 
And this is about average, but uh, it's very interesting to come back with uh, to come back to operator uh, A, which we already uh, seen before. And uh, as as you remember, there were a change uh, from of a bit time from zero second to two second, and uh, we see the similar change uh, in, in time of getting new block by testers. So. Yeah, like obvious, but very interesting. Uh, and uh, the next question that we can answer here, uh, does it, it in influence increased, uh, in, in increase uh, missed blocks? And actually we uh, can say that uh, we found answer here because uh, comparison of these two segments show actually uh, doesn't show any visible dependencies. So, uh, for example, these uh, light green bars is like segments of uh, node operators uh, which suspected to be players, and uh, this one is not. So, uh, we can see a uh, visible difference at least. But, but there is another topic and very interesting one. Uh, how it influenced to uh, a tester with was uh, because you know that if uh, uh, a tester uh, get blocks uh, slower, uh, they can uh, lose uh, in has in, in head accuracy and uh, uh, reward and, and rewards. And we see uh, exactly this story here. Uh, so uh, these dependencies show uh, dependency of losing. Uh, losing head, uh, losing rewards for accurate head, uh, depending on uh, bit delay time. And you can see here that uh, after one second uh, bit delay time, uh, the consequences is uh, pretty sad. And the case study here again about operator A. Um, so you, you can see here uh, the dependency between uh, increased uh, bit submission time and uh, increased uh, votes, uh, decreased decreased share of right uh, votes for this block. And uh, passing word uh, to Pavel. Yeah, thanks, Vladislav. Uh, so yeah. Uh, we can, I'll try to sum up what we've been talking about. So we kind of gave a rationale for the validators to delay their get header requests to the relays. Uh, we've seen that many partners are playing this uh, game. They're actually started delaying and some partners are doing it in a very severe manner, like by two seconds or yeah and it actually impacts the uh, process of attestations and rewards for testers um that's very hot topic um in terms of yeah resolution we see that it's quite harmful at least the delaying requests very much so what can be the solution to the problem next slide please um, on this slide, I'll just uh, kind of briefly list the proposed mitigation strategies. They are proposed by Kaspar and Mike in their research article. Uh, if you didn't read it, I highly recommend. Um, so there are different strategies. Uh, some strategies come to the relays, trying to impose more restrictions on them. So to, to remove the right from the validator to finish the block auction, therefore um, removing uh, the the increase in the rewards and the kind of the mechanism that stands behind it. Um, some uh, strategies they are trying to penalize the behavior, for example, missed block penalties. So this is a sort of damage control for the network. Uh, targeting yeah to control for the particular metric like 
missing or yeah, better to say slot success rate, proposal success rate, sorry. Uh, there are others. Um, yeah, we can probably discuss it here after our presentation. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. I'll finish with, yeah, kind of ideas for further research. As I've told that zero-sum game is a pretty strong statement that uh that that works in some ideal theoretical design but there are more factors to consider so it will be really nice to consider uh what is the actual source of the rewards uh decompose it and kind of prove it but yeah we still appreciate that mm. it's yeah important um the next topic to research is to explore what is the actual reason for global network um like latency or slowing down why there is a trend on uh increase of winning block submission time probably the increase of get header or the time that really uh spends on requests uh proceeding so yeah this topic is also interesting so yeah besides the timing games it may be useful to understand what's happening and i guess uh looking back at the examples that we have showed to you regarding the problems that arise with um uh, with timing games it will be nice to evaluate actual damage for the network um and that's pretty it. Thank you for your attention. Um, we're here again, if you want to outreach to us and discuss the topics or findings and discuss questions. Uh, so please, our tweeters. So thanks all. Do you want to add something, Vlad? Uh, no, actually, uh, yeah. Uh, th thank you very much for your attention. It was a long presentation, but I hope uh, these numbers and actually this research will help us to figure out what should we do next. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks both for the really, really cool presentation. Um, I know Tony is here, and Tony was was one of the the people that kind of um, like like brought up the whole issue of timing games from a more practical aspect and when he was uh, discussing like its possible impacts on Twitter, do you have any any questions or perhaps either of the folks from uh, Chorus One who've done similar analyses? Um, no real question from my side. I just, um, yeah, chapeau guys, really cool analysis. Um, maybe one comment. It would be very interesting to also look now that we know that certain entities are playing those games, looking into what are the what is the impact kind of what are what is the impact on the missed slots how many slots are missed and i guess at some point if you're delaying too much um, it, it's not even worth the profits anymore because you're losing out on too many consensus layer rewards plus execution layer rewards so i guess there there is a healthy balance somewhere in between but yeah I think I think that's now that we know how to analyze timing games. It would be very interesting to also analyze what is the what is the impact now. Uh, let, let me answer. Can I? Uh, yes, yeah, sh just short comment on this. Um, thanks, Tony. Um, we actually analyzed the misproposal uh, rate, and it was in the presentation uh, at some slides, and we didn't find any relationship between misproposal rate for those who are playing timing games. Uh, at least it can be due to the fact that these entities are kind of professional validators and uh, they just don't face the consequences. Probably the validators that are that have a weaker infrastructure, they uh, will kind of get more blocks missed, but we don't see it right now. Okay, yeah, that's that's good to hear. I also did some analysis on that. So I also saw some validators, I won't name them now, but I saw some of them missing much more slots now. Um, I, I think... almost unhealthy, unhealthy much slots. Um I think I think there is definitely some yeah, some um yeah, 
a big tale of impacts that come with playing those timing games. Definitely, I agree that the more professional you are as an operator, the the less um the, the the better you can you can keep the missed slots down um but of course yeah this is then a, a big centralizing force for the whole network because then um the small and weak solo stakers will not be able to compete anymore so i think i think um this is a, an important point that we should also consider yeah i think it like it to identify you know whether these operators were really missing more slots or not, you'd need to look at it in small time frames, right? So you would probably need to look at when they first started deploying these these strategies and they were kind of figuring out where the the barriers of like the the latency thresholds was were. Um and then the other thing that you need to take into account is that like not only are these operators large and professional, and so therefore they have like the ability to deploy or redeploy infrastructure really quickly in order in order to like potentially make networking easier, but they also have a lot of validators, right? So the amount of time that you need to tune your infrastructure is drastically shortened by the population of block proposals over which um, you, you can basically do it, right? If you have to wait a couple of months, like a solo staker for a proposal every time, um, it's very, very difficult to tune your infrastructure over, over those kinds of timeframes. If you can tune it multiple times per day, uh, it's a lot, a lot easier. But I agree with with Tony that if you look at it in small time frames, you can probably pick up uh, on when node operators were starting to think about doing this or what possible strategies they might use. the The tiered approach that you guys showed in one of your analyses that a uh, centralized exchange may or may not be doing, I think, is really, really interesting. Um, I wonder if it if it has to do with just like purely geographic setup of those validator groupings, or or it's actually something where they're like A, B, C testing um, different infra setups based on uh, pro proposal timings. That would be really interesting to, to understand. Um, and I think the, the other thing that is interesting to your point, Tony, around like what kind of um, effects does this end up causing in the, the wider community, like the disparity between large operators and small operators, but also the other agents in this space. So recently, one of the RPC providers is, is has launched a service where they basically create like uh, a relay for relays, right? Or something that proxies relay requests for you. Um, so that will aggregate them faster and push them across their network so that you don't have to deal with the issue of the latency between your validator and where that relay happens to have one of its nodes, but rather you can use their distributed nodes to get it faster. Um, and that also poses potential questions or concerns around centralization of the network, right? If eventually timing games are a new equilibrium that becomes really important to kind of position yourself around, uh, hopefully, or at least initially, it doesn't seem like this is something that's happening, but if it does in, in a year or two, if these RPC providers will be necessary for smaller organizations or smaller stakers to compete at the same level as the higher ones, um, that's also potentially a concern. Yeah, I fully agree with you. And and you also brought up a very good point that size in this case matters a lot because um, let's say you control a lot of validators. This then also means that you will have a lot of consecutive slots. So slots coming um, subsequently, which mm -hmm. then means basically what you could do is you could take your first slot, you aggressively play timing games. You could even wait until let's say second six in the slot, which is completely unhealthy and then use your second slot to kind of cement your block into the protocol because um, you will get a um, proposal boost for the second block. You will get um, the normal um, amount of attestations. And yeah, so stuff like this. I mean, this is just a, a very theoretical concept which um, might in practice not work, but basically, um, yeah, you could wait until second three without ha um, having to be afraid that maybe um, your block will be reorged by the next validator because it's you that is the next validator. Yeah, indeed. Okay, one question from the chat really quickly, um, and then we can go to the Chorus One presentation because I'm sure there's just kind of adjacent topics to discuss. Um, hey guys, thanks for the presentation. In one of the slides, you showed that the reduction you showed the reduction in head vote accuracy with the introduction of these delays. Uh, won't this put huge pressure on geographic centralization in order to stay competitive? basically increase the likelihood of voting on the correct head. How big of an issue do you consider this to be? 
Yeah, it's interesting. It's a very interesting question. So uh, we can uh, share this slide one more time just for everyone to see it. Here it is. Uh, so actually, I didn't get the second. Uh, uh, I didn't get the second half of this question. Uh, could you repeat it, please? Yeah. So the second half of the question is: um, Given the reduction in head vote accuracy, do you think that this will play, like, add extra pressure on geographic centralization? Uh, and I do you think that this is going to be a big issue? I don't think so because uh, uh, actually, uh, according to our research, uh, if there isn't any artificial delay, uh, the uh, actually the, the the delay is is not mu uh, more than one second. If uh, there oh. is there isn't any artificial delay, uh, it's uh, in, in under the one second. Uh, and it, it doesn't matter which geography we are talking about. But if we're talking about artificial delay, then you can put it like a two seconds, for example, uh, one, one and a half seconds. Mm -hmm. And here we see that uh, about a half uh, of our uh, attesters losing a lot of rewards for this uh, block. Yeah, let me also add. I guess the question was regarding the fact that uh, this uh, incorrectness in attesting comes to the validators that are located far away from the main cluster of the validators. Like, for example, if there is a validator far away from others in somewhere in Asia or Australia or Antarctic, I don't know. So they will face these problems because, yeah, they're kind of outsiders to the rest and uh, the rest won't be encouraged to shift their attestation uh, deadlines or yeah, moments when they attestate. Uh, so these guys that are far away from others will have to move their infrastructure to the more populated locations. And that sounds pretty uh, logical uh, in case if uh, no one from... Uh, yeah, the cluster that is located in more common uh, countries or yeah, this uh, locations like uh, US or Europe, uh, they, if they want to uh, shift their attestations, the outsiders will have to move their nodes to them. I think that's, that can that can happen. Awesome. Thank you, Pavel. Okay. Um, thanks a lot.